to you how background diffraction imaging can be applied to image particles under realistic conditions. So this is part of our ERC project called CARIN, and it's a collaboration between CEA, the European Synchrotron, the Technion, Ex Marseille University, IM2MP, the LEPMI, and DESI. And in this uh, recent day, so I had more to do with X-ray uh, absorption, radiography. Here, you uh, have uh, current X-ray diffraction. So here you can see some X-rays that are from my relatives. And I can say that this demonstrates the power of X-rays in medicine. So now, going back to the subject. So first, I will explain you the motivation of the work then the results of nano-focused bright imaging for enhanced catalysis, and I will end with a summary. So catalysis is everywhere in our lives. It's about 90% of chemical manufacturing processes. And now it's well um, realized that the surface light is strain, the deformation can be caused by surface relaxation, anisotropic strain, strain and grain boundaries, strain due to some core shell structure, as well as defects. There are key components for catalysis. And uh, quite recently appeared the concept of strain engineering catalysis. So you can uh, tune the strain in order to improve the catalytic performances of a particle. So the structure, meaning the type of assets, defects, crystallinity, and strain can be key parameter for the activity, selectivity, and reusability of nanocatalysts. Here, I show you an example uh, from a science paper during a reaction, which is the oxygen reduction reaction. What they have done, so they have a core shell structure, and they succeeded to create a tensile strain in the shell, and this decreased the catalytic activity by 40%. Then they perform a compressive strain, and this boosted the activity by 90%. So now it's well uh, realized that the structure can be a key for the performance of nanocatalysts, but there are still some challenges, which are to resolve the structure in real environment and at relevant scale, and to develop some predictive models. And uh, by chance, we have access to one technique, which is called bright coherent diffraction imaging, which has been developed 10 years ago by Jan Robinson and their co-workers. So um, we need some coherent illumination, a beam size which is larger than the particle. Now it can be applied in situ operando in complex active liquid gas environments. And what we can get, it's some dynamical structural imaging at the nanoscale. So we can get the strain, composition, shape, defects, and diffusion. Most of the experiments I'm doing are, are performed at the ID1 beamline. Here you can see a sketch of this beamline, and the diffractometer is a position at a distance of about 120 meters from the source. I'm also applying this technique to other synchrotrons, can be, I mean, DAISY or uh, SOLEI, where I'm doing also experiments. So how does it work? How bright current diffraction imaging is sensitive to strain? So here I show you an example. So you can see a particle, so a platinum particle. Here it's, uh, it has a size of about 300 nanometer. Then you can see the 3D bright peak. So uh, we are measuring in five minutes. The rocking curve is around uh, two degrees. As uh, you know, we are just measuring, only measuring the intensity. So the phase is lost. So we need to use some phase retrieval algorithms. So we are using a PyNX in our case in order to get the particle in real space. So what we can get is the electron density, meaning the morphology. Here you can see a top view of the particle, a bottom view. So at the beginning, we didn't note that there was a hole at the bottom of the particle, and we check with um, scanning electron microscopy, and this has been confirmed. And also what is very interesting is that we can get the phase, and the phase is proportional to the atomic displacement here in picometer. So we can access to the atomic displacement and to the strain. 
Here I give you the voxel size of the reconstruction. If we look more closely at the displacement, uh, we can see here that the corners edges are in blue color and the facets in red color, meaning that the corner and edges are in compression and here the facets are in tension. And this is quite important for catalysis because this can modify the sorption energies of reactants. So in few words, so the technique, it's a 3D technique. It has a spatial resolution of 10 nanometer. So we are working to improve the spatial resolution with the new source. And it has a strength sensitivity of about few 10 to the minus four. So now the question, how can these results, these experimental results, compare with atomistic simulations? So here I show you uh, the work of Maxime Dupraz. So I told you that we can get the morphology of the particle, what is called the support from phase retrieval. We have a resolution of about 10 nanometer, but we can fill this support with atoms. And then it's possible to do some atomistic relaxation. And with that, we can get the out of plane, the displacement. Here I show you the out of plane displacement and we can take the derivative to get access to the local strain. So we made a comparison between experiments and uh, simulation. Here, uh, it's the same uh, particle with the same shape. Um, and if we look at the size of the particle, this particle is a little smaller than uh, the measure of particle because it, at this time it was not possible to simulate a particle as large as the experimental particle. What I show you here is the strain, the out of plane strain along the 111 direction. And if we look at some of the facets here, I mean, in the experiments and in the uh, simulation, they are in a uh, tension here, the 113. If we focus on the 111 here, they are in uh, compression. So we can really see that the strain state is well captured by atomistic simulations, so we can investigate the surface relaxation of platinum nanoparticles. Here I show you another view of um, the particle to uh, look more closely at this uh, comparison. So this is a very good point, so it's sensitive to strain and we can look at the surface relaxation of platinum nanoparticles uh, I mean, in the, um, for, with our resolution. So uh, as the technique is quite fast, we can do some particle statistics. So we can look at particle. I mean, here we can see particle with a defect, with one defect. We can see a lot of twin platinum particles, so some twin particles uh, and with defects. So at the beginning, uh, we were quite um, surprised to see some twin platinum particles because uh, twinning is very rare in bulk platinum. If we compare to other material, uh, platinum has a very high twin boundary energy. And, but so in bulk, it's very rare, but we can see that in nanoparticles, we have a lot of these twin particles. And this technique is very interesting to look at uh, defects. Uh, and here I show you an example of a dislocation loop. So uh, here I've shown you some result with where we are looking at just one reflection. And nowadays we are looking now at multiple reflection to get the strain in the, all the directions. So here I show you um, this multi-reflection. So some measurements that we have performed on a nickel particle. And this nickel particle has here a nano twin here. So we have this uh, empty, um, so this void at this position because this part is not diffracting at the same uh, position in reciprocal space. So it was possible to measure several reflections. So now we are uh, doing multiple reflection uh, quite often to get the 3D strain state of the particle. So I show you here an example of this 3D strain tensor. So you can get the strain tensor, I mean, the different components of the strain 
along the different uh, directions, we also perform some simulation. So here we have simulated the out of plane strain, so along the Z direction. And this is in good agreement with uh, our measurements for this uh, nickel particle with a nanotrine. We can also uh, get access to the 3D atomic displacements uh, around the defects. So it's quite interesting. And here this work has been performed with a spatial resolution of 10 nanometer. So here I show you some examples, some ex situ examples. And the current project is really to do, uh, to look at uh, catalysis, I mean, to look, look at reaction in situ and operando. So to do it, uh, to have access at the 3D structure, the strain and defects, at the same time, monitor the activity of the particles and to develop some predictive model. For this, uh, we need some tools. Uh, compatible with the nanobeam. So we have developed uh, uh, in collaboration with TU Andoven, with uh, ESRF, we have developed some tools like a gas reactor. So you can see here an example so of this uh, gas reactor. It can go up to a temperature of 950 degrees. Uh, it's very interesting because uh, it's 3D printed. I mean, here you can see the water cooling. So the temperature, uh, st the stability of the, tempera the, the temperature is quite stable. And this is really necessary for nano diffraction experiments. And here you can see, uh, perhaps it's difficult to see it, but the reactor is installed at the ID1 beam line. And here you have the gas panel with all the gas bottles and all the mass flow controllers to control the gas reaction. So for the in-situ operando experiments, we have developed a gas reactor. And in collaboration with TU Andoven, we have developed an electrochemical cell. And we have a commercial battery cell from the University of Picardy. And the, uh, all these equipments, they are all compatible with nanofocus X-ray beams. So first, uh, I want to show you some uh, results that we obtain uh, during a gas reaction. So um, we look at one reaction, which is the CO oxidation reaction, which is to convert the toxic uh, CO into CO2, uh, which is uh, used in exosystem. And first, uh, for this, I will show you some of the results. So during the CO oxidation, I will show you how the twin boundary can migrate. Uh, so here you can see the gas reactor. So we had to work at a temperature of 450 degrees. Uh, so the particles are uh, active. Uh, I show you uh, an example of the diffraction pattern. And this is the diffraction pattern of a twin crystal. So you can see here the 111 streak, and this is um, this interface here, the signal of this interface. The other part can't be measured for at the 111 reflection because it has its 115 terminated. So uh, we are look at the we are look at the evolution of the diffraction pattern as a function of gas. If we look at the diffraction pattern. Uh, we can see that at the beginning, we have this nice tilted streak. And at the end of the reaction, we have a flat uh, here horizontal streak. So, there, so really the structure, I mean, the morphology of the particle, uh, it evolves during the reaction. And as we have some 3D diffraction pattern, we can get the um, uh, retrieve a particle in real space. So we can get it as a function of uh, gases. And what we can see here is that the volume of the particle here is changing during the uh, reaction. And what we have observed is that when we flow CO, we can see some twinning phenomenon. So we have a reduction here. We have some twinning, so some migration of the twin boundary. And uh, here for uh, at this um, 
for this gas condition and also at this uh, gas condition. And then there is a detwinning of the uh, particle. So how to explain the driving force of this uh, twinning? So for this, we had a collaboration with the CMAP and they have made some DFT calculations. So uh, we know that we have two types of first surfaces so for the twin crystal, so a 111 uh, surface. And for the other uh, grain, connected grain, it's a 115 uh, surface. They have calculated the coverage, the expected coverage for the experimental temperature and pressure. And uh, they obtain a lower coverage for the 111 platinum surfaces, so a lower coverage of CO. And if we look at the interfacial energy of our CO, we can see that it's preferential, here it's lower in the case of a 511 surface. So meaning that we have a lower 511 interface energy for CO. And uh, we think that this is the chemical driving force for this uh, twin boundary migration. I saw quite interesting, if we look more closely at the particle, we can see that at the beginning under CO, the particle is more, I mean, is more roundish. And after when we uh, inject some oxygen, we can see uh, some very small uh, facets forming on the particle. And perhaps here it's uh, easier to see these uh, small facets. And so we have some diffusion material transport during the reaction. And we can make a comparison with a work which has been performed uh, previously uh, on, uh, by uh, TM and by uh, microkinetic simulations. So they had a look at the CO oxidation and it was for smaller particles. And what they observe is that when the gas, I mean, if it's in um, a very rich, zero rich environment here, we are in zero rich environment. And here it's their uh, simulation. They see that we can, we should get, I mean, a roundish particle. Here it's black. So meaning that we should get some more roundish particle, more round particle. And when we have less CO, here it's gray, meaning that we should get some more faceted particle. So in this case, we are more, uh, we have some oxygen inside uh, the reactor. So we are uh, less, we are more, we are, sorry, more CO poor. So uh, we can get uh, the same equivalent um, results with some faceted particles. So this was also quite interesting. Uh, and so it was possible to um, connect a mass spectrometer. So we get uh, the product of the reaction and it was possible to get an idea of this product of reaction of the CO2 as a function of the different gas condition. Here, for sure, I mean, it's the result of the ensemble of particles. It's not on a single particle, but it's at least uh, interesting to see if the particles are reactive or not. So uh, here we have seen some defect dynamics, some twin boundary migration, and some facet dynamics during the CO oxidation. Now I want to show you uh, one of our work, another work on facet dependent strain evolution. I mean, uh, the different particles have a lot of facets and how uh, the strain can evolve depending on the orientation of the different facets. So this was the black time of ESRF. So we went to the DAISY synchrotron, so to the P10 beam line. So we install our reactor gas panel and we perform as so the CO oxidation. And here, so we work at 450 degrees. We again look at the 111 reflection. Here you can see the diffraction patterns. And uh, during the reaction, so here it's the stoichiometric CO oxidation reaction, we can see a clear change of the diffraction pattern compared to a pure uh, atmosphere, uh, uh, inert, sorry, atmosphere or uh, oxygen-rich atmosphere. 
So it's very interesting just to have a look at the diffraction pattern and to see that we can, uh, that there are some evolutions during this reaction. What was very nice, so perhaps you saw it here, it's that we have a lot of streaks, so meaning a lot of facets for the particle. So we measured three uh, particles. So a particle with a size of 300 nanometer, 650 nanometers, and 700 nanometers. And it was possible to index all the facets of these particles. So either we can index uh, in reciprocal space by uh, doing a polar figure, and we have all these tricks. And by uh, getting the polar figure, we can get all the uh, directions the normal of the facets, or as we have the retrieved particle in real space, we can do the facet indexation uh, using facet analyzer. So this is the plugin of Paraview. So it was possible to index all these three, I mean, index all the facets of these three particles. And uh, here I show you uh, all the different facets, so a table. So uh, we had some facets like 111, 100, 110, 113. So for instance, for the particle with a diameter of 300 nanometer, we have 32 facets. And for the particle with a diameter of 650 nanometers, we have uh, 43 facets. But this is very interesting because we will see how the different types of facets they can evolve during the reaction. So let's have a look at the small particle. So uh, it's like uh, that we have a movie of the evolution of the morphology and of the displacement of the uh, particle as a function of the different uh, gas conditions. Here I show you the first measurement in this gas condition and the last measurement of the gas condition. So first, what we can see so here, it's the bottom of the particle. Here is the top. So if we look at the bottom of the particle, we can see a very a strong evolution of the displacement of the strain at the bottom of the particle. So we know that there is an interfacial dislocation network. So that means that the gas can diffuse inside this uh, interfacial uh, dislocation network. So this was quite interesting because sometimes in TM it's very difficult to uh, know what's happening at the bottom of the particle. Then if we focus on the uh, reaction, on the stoichiometric CO oxidation, we can see uh, a strain, that strain bursts up during the CO oxidation. And it's very, very impressive to, to see it. So, then at the same time, we have a diffraction pattern. So with a diffraction pattern, we can get the full width at half maximum of a diffraction pattern. We can get the average strain. So the, there is no change of the average strain. From this uh, retrieve a particle, we can get the strain field energy. And here, what we can see is that when we are in the condition of C oxidation, so it's here, we have an increase of a full width at half maximum of the diffraction pattern, and also an increase of the strain field energy. So now um, I will focus more on what's happening during uh, oxygen, I mean, just when we are flowing oxygen. So uh, do we have oxygen adsorption or not? So we we'll see in the next slide. So here it's just at the beginning. So uh, we, are, we have our particle in inert gas. Here we are flowing oxygen. And just by, I mean, while flowing oxygen, we can see a change of the strain. So here we are looking at the strain along the 111 direction. So we can see a change of the strain uh, on the surface of a particle. And it's reproducible. I mean, here we have just done two cycles, but uh, for the second cycles, we have seen the same phenomenon. And uh, here, so the color is the strain. And if you look here, you can see different colors there. And this is just the difference of the strain between the last state here and this uh, initial state. 
And what we observe during adsorption, we can see, so I will tell you, that the strain evolution is facet dependent during oxygen adsorption. In fact, we have seen that all the 111 facets, uh, they will go here in red, they will go into tension. And the 100 facets and 113 facets, they will go into a compression. So we have seen this for the different particles. So uh, we can say that, the uh, that during oxygen adsorption, the strain is really facet dependent. And so how can we understand this? So uh, we know that oxygen will preferentially adsorb on corner and edges, and then they will uh, preferentially adsorb on the 113 and 100 facets. Um, and this explains why they are in compression and why they, uh, I mean, why oxygen with preferentially adsorbed on the 113 and 100 facets, it's because they have a lower coordination numbers than the 111 facets. And then to um, confirm this, we have performed, I mean, some GFT calculations. I mean, it's Corentin Chatelier, who is a part of the team. He has made some GFT calculation. What he has observed, I mean, is that here, you can see the strain for the 11 facets. And given the strain value, we assume that for the 11 facets, we have a quite low coverage of oxygen. And here, I mean, for the 100 facets, uh, if we look at the different results of the strain, we expect a very high, uh, higher coverage of uh, oxygen for these facets. So this uh, also confirmed that the oxygen will preferentially adsorb on the 113 and 100 facets, and this uh, will lead to this uh, compression. So uh, during uh, oxygen uh, adsorption, I mean, it's very facet dependent. Here, uh, I show you the two cycles. Uh, we are here, the initial state is the metallic state. Then we have some oxygen adsorption some change of the structure of a particle, then we can reduce here by doing some uh, CO oxidation. Uh, and then we have some oxygen desorption and we are back to the initial metallic st uh, state. So this is quite uh, interesting just to uh, see how adsorption um, occurs on the surface of the particle. Now let's have a look at the uh, C oxidation, uh, how it works. Is it facet dependent, the C oxidation? So for this, uh, we have calculated the average displacement for different types of facets here. So for different types of 110 facets and for different types of 113 facets. And what we observe is that here, if we look at the one one all facets here, we can see that some facets will not evolve. I mean, they will not evolve. Some they will go in uh, tension, some in compression. So during C oxidation, it's no more uh, facet dependent. So uh, it's no more facet dependent. We have some inequal reactivity of inantical uh, HK facets. And if we look more closely, so if we look here at this type of facet, it's zero minus one, one, or uh, this facet here, which is minus one, zero, one, it's located here and it's close to the um, substrate. This is the same thing here. If we look at these blue points, it's the minus one, minus three, one facet, and it's located close to the substrate. So what we have observed is that we have larger strand variations on the facets close to the substrate when we are doing this uh, C oxidation reaction. So this is support dependent. So in a few words, uh, we have seen some strong local structural changes associated to chemical interactions. The strain evolution is facet dependent during oxygen adsorption and um, it's support dependent during C oxidation. 
So we have some metal support interaction, which is important for performance in catalysis, and this can give some new insights uh, on the active sites during the reaction and the relation between the strain and chemistry. Now I will show you uh, what we can get in liquid conditions, so in electrochemical condition. I've shown you some example uh, during gas uh, experiments. So how is it uh, during liquid uh, experiments? And this is uh, the work of uh, Clément. So here we have an electrochemical cell which is mounted at the ID1 beam line. The idea is to uh, measure one single particle in the sulfuric acid electrolytes. Here you can see a CV curve. So it's typical of platinum and it's what has been uh, obtained uh, during the measurement. I mean, uh, we have a potentiostat which is connected to the electrochemical cell and the CV curve is uh, really in agreement with what can be obtained, I mean, in an electrochemical lab. So uh, we have looked at the evolution of the platinum particle and at the evolution of this strain as a function of applied potential. You can see here the evolution of the potential. So it's uh, in a region which is called double layer region. And if you look here at the strain, so it's along the OO2 direction, which is here vertical, we can see a real change of the strain of this particle uh, during electrochemistry as a function of applied potential. Uh, here I show you um, just a slice of the platinum uh, constructed particle. And if we look more at the corner of the particle, we can see that it's uh, more and more uh, displaced here. We can see the arrows or more and more blue. Meaning, uh, I mean, in this region, we note that there are some B sulfate adsorption. So here we can see that the bisulfate here will preferentially adsorb on the corners. And so I show you how the strain evolve. And if we uh, extract the strain at the edge and corner, this is going really in compression. At the surface, it's going more in a uh, tension. So here, I, don't, I will not say a lot about this, but just to say that um, we have some potential dependent strain distribution between the facets, which are highly coordinating atoms, and the under coordinated atoms, which are the edges and corners. And we can see it quite well during an electrochemical uh, reaction in 3D or through these slices. Uh, now I want to say some uh, words about uh, machine learning and uh, defect recognition. So uh, I show you some uh, very nice examples of uh, retrieved particles, but uh, we all know that uh, phase retrieval has some limits, uh, which are that don't, I mean, uh, phase retrieval doesn't always converge. It's the case of uh, highly strained nanoparticles or some particles with a lot of defects. So what was the idea? It was to stay in uh, the Fourier space because there have been a very nice demonstration in the paper of Maxime Duprat. Uh, he has shown, I mean, here that the defects, they have a very uh, defined signature in the Fourier space. So the idea was to develop a convolutional neural network for defect recognition from this 3D, from 3D current diffraction patterns. So to stay in Fourier space and just by looking at one 3D current diffraction patterns to know if there is or not a defect, a dislocation inside this particle. So can machine learning help us to screen particles and detect defects? So for this, it was uh, necessary uh, to develop, uh, to build the data sets. So the data sets, uh, we focus on metallic uh, nanoparticle, perfect or with a screw or edge dislocation um, with different shapes. So we have to cut uh, different planes. So they have uh, different shapes, but close to the wolf shape. And uh, we played with the position of a dislocation. This has been there, done sorry, with the Merlin software uh, to create so atomistic configuration with defects. So, 
then to be close to reality, uh, you need to relax uh, the, I mean, the structure of the configuration. So uh, then using lumps that have been some atomistic relaxation and to get a data set, I mean, we need some 3D diffraction pattern, some simulated 3D diffraction pattern. So this has been calculated using the PyNX software. So then it was possible to have a, a data set with perfect crystal, crystals with a screw dislocation, hedge dislocation. It's, it was about 1 million atoms with a size of a diameter of about 30 nanometers. As I told you, it was uh, very uh, necessary to do some atomistic relaxation to be closer to experiment reality. And after this, once you have a data set, you need uh, to develop the convolutional neural network. So uh, as an input, uh, you have the 3D current diffraction pattern and as an output, so there is a um, series of uh, layers, conditional layers, and at the end, there are three uh, numbers, which are probabilities of these three classes. So either no defect, either screw dislocation, or edge dislocation. So to test the neural network, the neural network has been uh, tested on simulated data. So about 100,000 diffraction intensity, and this has to be split into a training data set, validation, and test set. So for the training, so here are a few numbers. So it has been obtained through ADAM optimization with a learning rate of 0.001 and a batch size of 64. So the accuracy score on the test set was about 95%. And uh, in machine learning, it's quite nice to uh, look at the confusion matrix. It says how good uh, works the network and how good it can uh, predict, um, for instance, perfect uh, dislocation. And here we can see that it, it works quite well. I mean, it can very well predict perfect um, nanocrystal. And yes, so more trouble to uh, detect uh, a crystal with an edge dislocation. Then, which was very interesting, and all this work, I mean, it's the work of uh, the internship of Bruce Lee, of uh, Ewan Belek, who is working at the ID1 Beamline, and Maxim. Uh, all this work, I mean, has been also uh, compared with uh, experimental data. Here, I just show you some experimental data that we um, have taken at Soleil. So we have a diffraction pattern from a particle without defect and diffraction pattern from a particle with a screw dislocation. So here, to be sure that we have a screw dislocation, we have to do phase retrieval and to confirm that we have a screw dislocation. So if we look at the uh, results, so here it's our diffraction pattern uh, with no defects. And the prediction is quite good. I mean, we say that it's a perfect crystal. So here the probability is high for a perfect crystal. And for the screw dislocation, it's the same thing. It, it says uh, quite well here uh, that it's a, a screw dislocation just by looking at this three uh, diffraction pattern. So here uh, we had also a look at different data sets, experimental data set taken at uh, Soleil, and um, DAISY at PIT and Beamline, and they all work. And uh, so we can say that defect recognition works on experimental data. Then I wanted to say a few uh, words about the news from the EBS upgrade. So what's the news? I mean, news from the ID1 Beamline, and they're uh, connected to the project. So I show you what we can do in situ a Prando. And I mean, the dream of everyone is to go to atomic scale and real time. So can we measure smaller nanoparticles with better resolution and do faster measurements? So uh, we hope, I mean, uh, we are not yet there, but to uh, be closer to the atomic resolution and to measure faster. And for this, so we had the EBS upgrade with an increase of 40 for the brilliance and coherence. So the idea is to be more and more surface interface sensitive and to uh, have access to a slow motion movie to um, look at 
write limiting steps during operation and look at particle refaceting, defect formation, absorption, adsorption, diffusion. So I mean, in uh, Bragg X-ray, so the ultimate goal is to have an ultimate Bragg X-ray microscope that works close to the atomic scale in real time. So, uh, and to work at high energy with currents with Bryant's. So um, we have made some measurements on some platinum particles with a size of 20 nanometer in 3D. And we have seen that it's, uh, I mean, these particles, they are embedded in two um, uh, sapphire uh, substrates. So they were stable under the beam. And we can see that with the new EBS beam, it's possible to measure the 3D diffraction pattern of some 20 nanometer platinum particles. There have been some work with Maxim showing that now we can uh, look at uh, superstructure reflections uh, with weak signal. And uh, here it's for a platinum nickel particle. So we can see here the signal from the 2OO um, reflection and from its superstructure reflection. And also we can measure at high energy. So there have been some demonstration with Steven that it's possible to do some measurement at 20 and 33 kV. Um, I mean, it allows, I mean, we um, are using the higher X-ray penetration. We can look at embedded grains in polycrystal and we hope for less beam damage. Then uh, another point, I mean, I show you a lot of uh, results of phase retrieval. And um, I want to uh, tell you that when we are doing some in-situ operando experiments, we really need to do some uh, online an analysis. I mean, we need to know if we are going in the good direction, if we can see effects, if we have to change our parameters or not. So for this, um, we have um, uh, David, I mean, all the PhD students of the uh, and postdocs of the ERC project, they have worked. Uh, how to improve, I mean, the reproducibility of the BRAC CDI data treatment. And David uh, has made a very nice uh, Jupyter, I mean, graphical uh, interface based on a Jupyter notebook. So it's called Grayer. So it um, allows to use at the same time, and it's very easy to use. It allows, it allows to use a BCDI for pre, the BCDI package from Jérôme Carnis for the pre-processing part. Then uh, the phase retrieval, uh, the PyNX package from Vincent Favre Nicolas, and the post-processing part, BCDI from uh, Jérôme Carnis again. And to do it on the same Jupyter notebook, so it's quite uh, easy to use it and it helps us a lot during our experiment to get some online analysis. So I would say it's very user friendly. So if you want to test it, uh, it's uh, really welcome. And um, also one question was the reproducibility of the results. So uh, one of the good idea was to set all the parameters. So all the parameters of the pre-processing part, phase retrieval and post-processing part in just one H5 file. So someone can repeat and use the same parameters to compare and check uh, the data treatment. And everything is saved in one H5 file and it's um, then very easy to reopen with the uh, software, with a graphical uh, interface. So if you want to know more about uh, this um, graphical interface based, based on Jupyter Notebook, um, I mean, I hope there will be soon the paper from David, or you can have a look at all the videos he made about how to use this software. And uh, then to uh, uh, end this presentation, I want to thank all uh, the team who worked on the project. So all the uh, PhD students, so I don't uh, show you uh, the work of Sarah and Nikita, but uh, they're, I mean, they're working on battery and their inundation, all the work of the uh, postdocs and uh, previous postdocs. Uh, the very, I mean, nice collaboration with the ID1 beamline here. I mean, it's an old photograph, but uh, nice, uh, uh, very, um, I want to thank uh, a lot, uh, Stephen, for his uh, very nice help. I mean, during all the experiments, 
a collaboration with Let Me, Technion, and my collaborators from Marseille, from the CA, and the funding, so the ERC uh, funding. So there are two open postdoc positions, so don't hesitate to apply. So one is on time resolve BCDI, another one is on nano imaging with deep neural networks, and there is one open PhD position uh, to continue the work on BCDI and electrochemistry. So um, yeah, don't hesitate to apply for these uh, positions, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mara Ingrid. This was a very, very nice overview of your recent work. And now I invite everyone to uh, raise their hands and unmute the microphone to ask questions. And I hope to have a lively discussion. Don't be shy. I would also like to maybe ask um, David Simon if he's interested, he can copy the uh, the github uh, address on the in the chat so everybody who's interested can uh, can copy it uh, so Maringri, I, I do have a few questions actually um one is a, is a bit of a curiosity i recently participated to surface uh, uh, a conference on surface uh, x-ray neutron and uh, there is still lots of uh, an, um, measurement on catalysts and using surfaces can you can you tell can you comment about this uh, complementarity or can you see that actually this uh, operando studies on nanoparticles will actually take over and completely wash out all the uh, ideal surface uh, measurement yeah so yeah this is a good point so um uh, and this is also a part of the uh, PhD phases of uh, David so he's doing his uh, PhD phases at um Soleil at the success beam line. And the idea is to compare what we can do with surface diffraction and Bragg CDI. So he's doing, uh, he has done some beam times on Bragg CDI looking at the same uh, platinum particles during a reaction. So the idea yeah, is really to compare what we can get with surface diffraction and uh, Bragg current diffraction. And one, one of the goal will be uh, really to um, merge the two techniques uh, because uh, I mean uh, with the bright current diffraction we can see these very nice tricks so then the idea will be to go very far along the CTRs of the particle and one of the goal to access I mean to the atomic resolution will be to try to combine I mean uh, these uh, two techniques. Alex please. Thanks Dina. I had a question immediately and then I couldn't find the hand. <laughs> At okay. the end, I made it. Thank you, uh, Marie Ingrid, uh, for this. I, I thought it was very nice to see this clear potential dependence in the strain of this particle. Um, I don't, I mean, maybe I've missed something, but I don't think we've seen that before, right? In that clear way. Uh, yeah, no, there was the central work. I mean, Jan Robinson has shown a very nice work with fuel. Uh, and he has shown that um, uh, the, I mean, the power of uh, BCDI to look at uh, adsorption. There was a work of uh, previ a previous work from uh, Jan yeah. Robinson on this. Sure, sure, but it, but it's but like in the double layer, it it uh, it's, it's ah, very sorry. impressive. Ah, you, you mean you... yes, in the electrochemistry, yes. Yes, 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 exactly. Y yes, so you I see mean, it uh, in the double layer region. Yes. Of course, if you say it's the double layer region, it means that you don't have. You don't expect to have sulfate absorption there, adsorption there, but there might be some at low level. But I'm like, what I what I wonder about is how do you I mean, how do you interpret that? Because you there might you might you might think about you know quite a few different uh, uh, processes which could give this this strain effect, right? Yeah. So um, up to now, I mean, uh, so there are a lot of papers, surface diffraction papers on electrochemistry, and in the double layer region, they observe for platinum 111 there, uh, and 100 a clear demonstration of uh, B sulfate adsorption. So there, there, yes, there is uh, this type of adsorption. Because you were thinking of other phenomena to yeah, I mean, explain. Uh, I don't, yeah, I mean, I don't know what they would be, but I mean, you have, at the very least, you're changing the surface charging, right? So. Yes. Um, so, yeah, yes, I agree. I saw, um, because 
here we don't show it, uh, I don't, I didn't show you here, but just we have compared um, one particle uh, out of the electrolyte and in the electrolyte. And just without applying, uh, I mean, the potential, we can see some changes of the strain, yes. Just inside the electrolyte, yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay, cool. So, so I, I just, I mean, I just wonder how you, like what, what your opinion is on this, like will, it, will this be a useful tool um, given that the interpretation is not straightforward? I mean, we can see where stuff happens, right? But, but what is it? Um, Yes, so um, up to now, yeah, we have to make some hypotheses, I mean, from uh, previous literature. And, uh, but we have also ideas of uh, um, having some collaborations with groups, making some uh, like DFT uh, calculations and hmm. uh, to predict, uh, I mean, this train state, yes. So um, just my... A follow-up question then is like, what can you see anything in the hydrogen absorption region? Yes. So, so because um, there you, I mean, there you really know what's going on, and that's very well um, established mm -hmm. from single single crystal electrochemistry. Um, yes. So um, here it was not the topic of his work, but recently um, we have made um, an experiment, and we look uh, in the region of hydrogen absorption. So we are still um, looking at the data, doing the data treatment, but yes, we have seen, uh, and, and this is, I mean, a region where you, we can do a uh, bright CDI, yes. Yeah, because saw... I mean, for, for uh, you know, for, I mean, sulfate adsorption happens on terraces, right, on 111 terraces, but, but hydrogen adsorption, those two peaks that you have there, that's 110 and 100 steps. So I would imagine that if, like, if adsorption, um, really gave a clear signature in, in the um, BCDI strain, then um, you would light up kind of edges instead on the hydrogen peaks there. But I guess, uh, I guess that's uh, still, still to do, I mean. Yes, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I see a comment from Clément who says that uh, you do have some data in this region. I don't know, Clement, if you want to add anything. Uh... Yeah, I just wanted to add that we, we got some data in the hydrogen region. And uh, as Maringrid said, we just have to uh, analyze them. So th that's it. But yes, this is a, probably a, a more interesting um, region in terms of uh, um, electrocatalytic reactions. Cool. That sounds, that sounds fantastic. Thank you. Thanks. Uh... Other questions, comment? Vonsok, please. Unmute yourself. Hello. Uh, thank you very much for a very nice talk. Um, I have one, maybe two questions regarding electrochemistry experiment. Um, uh, how did you uh, um, adjust the thickness of electrolyte layer over the sample? Because we have been uh, uh, we have tried years of uh, years ago, and we have uh, some problem to set the right thickness of the electrolyte. Some uh, if we set uh, if we set the uh, thickness of the electrolyte layer too thin, then we couldn't see any uh, behavior uh, electrochemistry behavior on the sample. Yes. Said, yeah, yes. Here, the thickness is about 300 micrometers, is hundreds of micrometers. And um, we can, um, I mean, and we are working at 13 kV, uh, just to be sure to penetrate the electrolytes and, uh, and to stabilize. I mean, we are, con we are, I mean, the electrochemical cell is connected to peristatic pump. And we try to keep this uh, thickness. I mean, it's few hundreds of micrometers. And at 13 kV, uh, it works uh, quite well uh, with, uh, I mean, uh, EBS or beam, yeah. I see. And the parasitic pump will push the bubbles away from the sample as well? Yeah, yeah. so um, we have seen that if we are not using it, we are forming a lot of radicals on the surface. And uh, we can, I mean, it's, I mean, on the CV curve, uh, when you, we are not using the peristatic pump, we can see an increase of the current when the beam is on. So it's very, I mean, X-ray sensitive. So we have really to be careful and to work in the good conditions. 
Okay, thank for, you. for electrochemistry, because yeah, 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 it's very sensitive, and we can see it uh, with the uh, uh, CV curve. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I have been watching that. So, oh, we were chasing two crystals, and one we we were excited to see the evolution strain evolution inside the crystal. Actually, we uh, observed the, the huge big changes in the diffraction pattern. And then we moved to the another sample and we didn't see anything. So okay. X-ray induced a lot of uh, changes on a sample. Yeah, I totally agree. And there, um, we have um, uh, work a little yeah, with Clément just to uh, look by changing parameters of an electrochemical cell of the flow, how it can impact the, um, uh, the measurements. And the, there, yeah, it, it's so, uh, I mean, uh, there are, yeah, we have to be really careful about beam damage, yes. Okay, thank you. Ross, I think you're next. Yeah, I was just curious how you control the, the um, or where the electrodes are and how you control the sort of evenness of the electric field across the sample. Are these uh, thin film cells good at that or, or do you have a sort of inhomogeneity? So yeah, we, we are using here this uh, electrochemical cell and uh, Clément is doing us. So, I mean, he's, it's a collaboration with LEPMI. So it's a laboratory focused on electrochemistry and he's looking at the same sample using the cell at the beam line and a conventional cell that is used by electrochemists. And we obtain really the same uh, CV curve. So that's why we are quite confident about the process. I see. So you haven't like looked at, at crystals near the edge of the sample and crystals in the middle of the sample and seen different behavior or anything like that? Mm. It's true that, um, yeah, for, for this uh, study, uh, we just, yeah, we measure several particles, I mean, and we focus on one particle, but yeah, it would be nice, as, as you said, to do some statistics to look more at the different particles around the uh, substrate, yes. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Tillman. Yes, uh, it was a really nice talk. I really enjoyed it. I have one perhaps a bit technical question on the on the peristaltic pumping that you mentioned. I take it that you also keep on pumping during the experiment. So I was wondering because I, I noticed quite a lot of uh, pressure spikes from this kind of pumping. So I'm wondering if this uh, this is slightly moving your crystal and if this has an impact on your, your data. So yeah, the peristaltic pump is on. Uh, we haven't seen some movement of the particles. So here, the trick is that the particles, they are de-weighted on the glassy carbon substrate and the electrode. And uh, as they are de-weighted, they are strongly linked to the electrode. And uh, we have made some uh, measurements with uh, chemically uh, grown particles, and they were not very stable. But here we have some, uh, de we have, we are working with de-weighted particles who have um, a link with the substrate. And I mean, um, we haven't seen uh, the particle moving during the experiment, except in the uh, oxygen uh, desorption uh, in, in this region. I mean, when we go to a um, potential higher than 0.6, so there is, a, we are in the oxidation region and uh, there, are some, there is some corrosion of the uh, electrode and at this point the particles uh, starts moving but it's due to the corrosion of the uh, electrode of the support okay well then good on you for for fixing this problem <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah yes to fix this problem corrosion of the electrode it, yeah it's a little more difficult i mean uh, this double layer region and the hydrogen region is easier to measure yeah okay. thank you other questions, comments, or curiosities? Uh, I have one about the uh, machine learning. Uh, it's actually something that is it's gaining uh, more and more interest from this community. Um, you show that you can recognize uh, certain types of defects. Uh, 
how do you use this knowledge for the face retrieval? Can you, have you found a way to, to use it? Could you, I don't know, use it as an educated guess for the starting conditions for retrieval or? Um, yeah, here uh, it's, uh, it was just classification. I don't know if we can use classification. I mean, this result, the fact that we have a defect or no in the phase retrieval. But I mean, um, here I just show you results on classification, but we are working on using a um, neural network for phase retrieval. Yes, I saw. Okay. So we have a work on just 2D uh, diffraction patterns and uh, it seems to start working and we have to see in 3D how it works, yes. Okay. Uh, so but uh, yes, I, I think there have been some very nice demonstrations from the group of, I mean, uh, of Jan Robinson and uh, from APS that uh, um, machine learning can help, I mean, uh, uh, for phase retrieval, yes. And uh, I mean, we still need to make some tests that perhaps to see if it can replace phase retrieval. There's some hope, yeah. We have, but uh, still, yeah, a lot of work to be done, yes. But at least for classification, seems to uh, to work. But for phase retrieval, I mean, um, to get the, the phase and modulus uh, with machine learning, I mean, uh, we have to uh, get a lot of uh, data set or, I mean, or there was this demonstration that it's possible just by one data set that it can fit, uh, it can fit well. But yeah, we, we will work in, the, uh, in this direction, yes. And I've, I also would like to highlight uh, the, the, the fact that you are um, ma ba basically making data analysis available. Do I understand well with this uh, uh, interface? So that's actually very, very good. Uh, yeah, don't hesitate to try, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I see that some people are leaving. I think that I can officially close the session. Thank you so much again for your uh, participation. But then as usual, uh, whoever wants to stay a little longer for uh, saying hi or make, having a little bit more informal chat, we stop the recording also now so we can say anything <laughs> we like. And uh, thank you again and I well appointment to the next time. Thank you, Dina, yes. So Marini, I was very curious about um, the uh, you know, the, all this data that you're doing in electrochemistry and in, in these conditions, I mean, uh, the, how do you solve the uh, st particle stability? Uh, I've seen you've, you've shown these uh, results on 20 nanometer. It's really cute uh, that you managed to do so, but how do you keep the particles still? Yeah, here, I mean, the, for this 20 nanometer particle, um, they were embedded inside sapphire. So this is a big trick. I mean, they are embedded. But I mean, um, there were a lot of issues about uh, beam uh, stability. At the beginning, we wanted to uh, work with the focus beam with the size of 50 nanometer, just to be sure to focus, I mean, to have a very high flux on the particle. And I mean, it was very difficult to uh, make uh, this 15 nanometer beam stable on our particle. Steven is working very hard on uh, interferometer for the ID1 beam line. So uh, I mean, uh, maybe in few months, we will have this interferometer and this will be uh, maybe uh, more easier. So we, have, we had to enlarge the beam to be sure to stay on the particle. And here the trick is that, yeah, the particles, they were embedded. But I think, I mean, um, on the weighted particles, it should also work. And um, yeah. So I, do I understand, well, this, this, uh, they were not staying fixed for the 3D or they were not just not staying fixed for the... I uh, know, yeah, uh, here, these particles, they were fixed for the 3D. But uh, just um, we wanted, I mean, uh, because they were embedded in, inside a sapphire, so it was fine. But you need, in, uh, if you work with a beam of, I mean, just the size of your particle, it's uh, difficult during the working curve to, yeah. I mean, to make that the beam is um, always looking at your particle. Okay, so you so have just to enlarge curve. the beam just to be sure that you are really well on the center of rotation. So we, and it's 50 nanometers is uh, Fresnel zone plate, right? Uh, yes, yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. So it was more to be sure that the particle, I mean, the beam, everything was in the center of rotation, yes. 
Okay. So, any other common questions? Ahmed Ingrid, you are uh, you have the right to stop us anytime. <laughs> okay. It's enough. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I think it becomes really, really difficult to keep a center of rotation on this 100 nanometer scale. I mean, this. Mm, on the nanometer scale, I would say it's fine because we are doing a lot of experiments at ID1 and it's working quite well. I mean, for 50 nanometer, it's more difficult, but I would say 100 nanometer, it's seems okay yes uh, how is it working the energy scan this is always a real huge question isn't it <laughs> yes sir we, and we all uh, seem to have some issue with retrieving data with a um, um so and... i have not shown her um i mean um, uh, there is a uh, saha uh, she is doing a, a phd phases uh, on uh, inundation so she needs to do um uh, i mean uh, energy scans and uh, I think so. We have performed the phase retrieval, and it seems to work well. So we are using the BCDI package, and uh, I think which I would say so. During the experiment, it was working quite well. I mean, the mm, so because that, that should oh. solve largely these issues. Isn't it? How far are you scanning energy? Is it like a kilovolt or a kilovolt and a half? Sorry. Yeah, for this when, you, when you do the energy scans, what's the range? Is it like a kilovolt or, or more? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would say at least, uh, yes, uh, 100 or uh, 400, uh, yeah, 400 EV or 400 EV. Yeah, yeah. yes, 500 EV. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But we, yeah, but uh, yes, uh, you, you really have to track the rest of the peak. So to track yeah. in Dell. And um, yeah, and Steven has made a very nice script at the ID1 beamline, and it's uh -huh. working quite well. So yeah, mm -hmm. he has worked a lot, uh, Steven, uh, to make it work and to keep the, I mean, to keep the um, particle on the detector and to track as so the, the Dell movement. Yeah. Actually, it's a pity that uh, Alex left, but I think that they were trying. Um, because uh, Nanomax has a, a detector arm, like a robot, uh, then they were also trying to kind of move away uh, the, to change the distance so that, you know, you didn't have to reshape and rebin all the pixels for different energy in the Q range. Uh, but um, I don't know where they are. Because... But it's true that we are, I mean, uh, we are not uh, reshaping the pixels and there's, we compared uh, the measurements uh, doing uh, done by uh, normal measurements, conventional rocking curve and energy scan, and it was quite okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I kind of wonder what resolution you have to get to before it matters. We we we, we looked into the same thing. Andrew Olivestead actually did a measurement where, as a function of energy, we moved the detector closer and further, and uh, and it worked out to be you know, just a few centimeters over a half a kilovolt scan or something ah, okay. like that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it just didn't really seem to matter. But I suspect when you're doing like a, a really large resolution, um, mm -hmm. meaning you're, you're doing a long energy scan, you have to maybe pay a little more attention to it or, or resample. In, in, in your ah, okay, but you mean that you are moving, uh, I mean, the, the detector is more or less closer because yeah. we, we are just... Yeah. Moving. Oh, okay, yeah. okay, we are not doing Yeah, we, we, like we, would, we would chase in, in, in all three dimensions. We'd be chasing in delta and gamma and oh, okay. distance. Um, so you I have think a translation. Study, we, only, we only chased in one. We only moved the distance because we weren't scanning very far. So the whole signal fit onto, onto the detector. Um, but yeah, we, we've done a couple of energy scans that were maybe a kilovolt and a half one mm -hmm. sec. Is that right? Where we actually chase the diffraction pattern. Um, and with two two diffractometer motions, um, those were quite painful measurements. I suppose. So you have a, a longitudinal translation, motorized translation for the detector on the detector arm. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We have about a two meter long stage, and the okay. detector can motor forward and backward. The measurement was not that crazy. No. Well, yeah, we wrote a little 
back macro to you know move the detector and then yeah. measure and then move the detector and measure and it would always have an overlapping frame so it would it would measure it would move the detector it would remeasure and then it would start moving yeah. the energy again uh, so you could realign everything because the detector doesn't move perfectly yeah. and, and it all worked but it was just a nightmare to assemble all the data and, and do anything with it yeah. And then we don't have the photons to really make anything out of these high energy uh, differences. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, in the BCDI package, uh, Jérôme Carnis work a lot on how to uh, deal with energy scans, and we are uh, using it. And uh, yeah, it seems to be fine on our side. Yes. And we just use actual utilities. You just tell it your energy step, and it gives you. The yes, or for... yes, but he's also yeah. using. I mean, he's also using extra utilities, and he has also uh, write a code to make it differently. I saw yeah. 